Hi, Steve Ellingson here. The topic for this video is Colpit's voltage controlled oscillators. So first let me note that uh, these notes assume that you are familiar with a previous video and set of notes that I did. Those notes are entitled Analysis and Design of a Typical Colpit's Oscillator. And that was for a fixed frequency oscillator. And what I'm going to do in this video and set of notes is revise that design to accommodate variable frequency operation. So this will become a voltage controlled oscillator or VCO. So here's the design. The original schematic is shown in black ink here. That's the one I discussed previously. The modification is shown over here. So it consists of a capacitor, C4, a diode here, which is a special kind of diode known as a varactor. A varactor is a diode that exhibits capacitance that varies with its bias voltage. So this is drawn as a diode, but it actually is being used as a capacitor, and its capacitance will be varied according to a bias voltage, which I've indicated here as V-tune. And we refer to that as a tuning voltage. So this is what makes this a voltage-controlled oscillator. We're modifying the tank with a variable capacitance. If you'd like to see a particular example of a varactor, uh, my suggestion would be to look at the uh, BB535. If you just Google that term, uh, you'll probably be able to pull up a data sheet, and it's a good example of uh, such a device. The purpose of C4 is to keep the voltage, the tuning voltage, from being shorted out by uh, the inductor here, L1. If we don't have C4, and we apply this tuning voltage, it will simply be shorted to ground. So C4 is required to block the diode bias from ground and keep it from being shorted out. You might ask where the tuning voltage comes from, and uh, one way would be simply to use a digital analog converter. So under computer controlled, you could set a tuning voltage, or more simply, you could just use a potentiometer, a variable potentiometer uh, that is a resistor with a knob on it. If you do that, you'd want to put a big resistor right here so that that uh, device does not load the tank. Important to see high impedance looking out that way so that the circuit that's creating the tuning voltage does not interfere with the tank operation. So the analysis of this thing is pretty straightforward. It looks more complicated, but it's really just a small variation to the original analysis. The new tank is the same as the old tank, except now we have this variable capacitance in parallel with the inductor. I'll call it C sub T for convenience. C sub T is simply C4, that bias blocking capacitor, in series with C5, which is the uh, varactor diode. And of course, you put those in series, that's the value of C sub T. The relationship between V sub B and V sub E in this case is again given by a voltage divider, but now the voltage divider has this modified term in the numerator and the denominator, where again I'm using the notation that X sub T represents the uh, reactance of something, in this case the reactance of the tuning capacitance, that's minus 1 over omega CT. So the voltage gain of the tank, given by VB over V sub E is given by this expression. We apply the same assumption as before that R sub L, the series resistance of the inductance, is much less than its reactance, and we get this simplified expression. Now in this case we can simplify, we should do that in advance. First, note that if you take the parallel combination of two impedances that are purely reactive, you get the parallel combination of those uh, reactances with a J out in front. So this is just confirming this thing, which you probably already know. And now we can use that to come up with this modified expression for B. We note that the J's cancel in the numerator and the denominator, so we end up with this expression, confirming that the phase of B equals zero, as is required by the Barkhausen phase criterion. At resonance, we have that X1, X2, X3, and XL in parallel with X sub T must be zero. That's simply saying that all the reactances add up to zero at resonance. So we have the X3 plus the parallel combination of X sub L and X sub T is minus X sub 1 plus X sub 2. We can use that to replace X sub 3 plus X sub L in parallel X sub T in the um, 
in the original expression. We get this simplified expression, which is now just in terms of x1s and x2s. And as before, we get the exact same expression for the voltage gain of the tank, C1 plus C2 over C2. So nothing has changed by adding this tuning capacitance. Now the loop gain analysis, again, very similar to before. We need the impedance looking out of the emitter, which I'm calling Z sub L. That's given by this parallel combination, which shows up here, which in turn is in parallel with this combination, which is shown here. So a little bit more complicated, but the same approach is used. As before, we require that R sub E, that bias resistor on the emitter, is much, much greater than the magnitude of x sub 2. That lets us simplify this half of the parallel combination to just j x sub 2. On the other side, I expand out this expression. We're just writing it out as the product over the sum. Now I invoke the idea that the series resistance of the inductor should be much less than its reactance plus that of the um, uh, tuning capacitance, and I get this simplified expression. I can split those two terms, as shown here, and then I simply note that this part right here is x sub l in parallel with x sub t. So the expression we get for the output impedance is that it is approximately equal to the impedance of C2 in parallel with this thing, and now we play the trick again with uh, resonance. We're interested in this value at resonance, and at resonance we get that this whole mess is just equal to J times minus x2. So the impedance looking out of the emitter is given by this expression at resonance. Next, for convenience, I'm going to give this term here a name. xt over xl plus xt, I'm going to call alpha. And that's going to simplify the math here a little bit. Using that notation, I have, writing it out as product over sum, this expression. I can just multiply through the numerator. I get x2 squared plus j alpha x2 r sub l over alpha r sub l, and I can write that out in two terms, as shown here. Next, let me consider what this actually turns out to be. I can write this out in terms of capacitance and inductance, as shown here. That simplifies to this expression, and I'm going to require, for simplicity, that omega naught squared L1CT is much, much less than 1. Because if I assume that, then alpha will always be just about 1. And that's pretty simple to deal with. So again, I'm making this constraint or this requirement simply to simplify the equations. I'll justify that in a moment. If I make that assumption, then the output impedance, looking at the emitter at resonance, simplifies to just x2 squared over r sub l, since r sub l is much, much less than magnitude of x2, as established previously. And this is the same result that we obtained earlier, that is, before we added c4 and c5, so this is convenient. So again, we're choosing this simplification to make things simpler. Now, is this a reasonable requirement? Well, let's just throw in some numbers. For a frequency of 15 megahertz, an inductor of one microhenry, a tuning capacitance of 10 picofarads. Again, those are three arbitrarily chosen numbers. But just to show you uh, what happens, we get that this factor is just a little bit less than 0.1. So 0.1 is certainly much less than 1. So it's plausible, but you need to check this each time. But don't assume that it's always going to be the case. You should remember that you've made this assumption and then verify that it's uh, correct. Now, since Z sub L at resonance is the same as before, we obtain the same requirement to satisfy the Barkhausen gain criterion that was derived in the previous uh, lecture video and notes, namely that the transconductance times x1 times x2 should be much greater than the series resistance of the inductor. So again, under this simplification, we obtain this criterion for meeting the Barkhausen gain criterion. Okay, now the tuning equation, that is, how do we determine the resonant frequency? Once again, at resonance, all the reactances cancel. Here I'm writing out that last term as product over sum. Multiplying through by that denominator, rearranging terms on the right, doing some more algebra gives me that x sub l is this expression right here. In terms of component values, we have this relatively ugly looking expression, which we can simplify by multiplying through by minus omega on the top and the bottom. 
we get this. Now in the previous analysis, we required that C3 be much, much greater than C1 and C2, that simplified analysis. If we apply that here, the C3 disappears, we get this expression. And also in the previous analysis, we, again for simplicity, required C1 and C2 to be equal. So if we apply that simplifying assumption, then the expression simplifies to this. So we see dramatic simplification. A little bit of algebra gives us this, and then finally this. So the tuning equation becomes this expression, which looks very similar to the expression that we got before. It is simply that we have a tank inductance, which is still L sub 1, a tank capacitance, which is modified slightly. Before it was just C1 divided by 2. Now it's C1 divided by 2 plus that tuning capacitance C sub t, which is a series combination of C4 and C5. So this turns out to be quite simple. So to summarize, this is very similar to the fixed oscillator analysis that we did previously. The loop gain is essentially the same as long as we make the simplifying approximation, which is in addition to what we assumed before. It's a simple modification to the tuning equation, namely that term right there, the tuning capacitance. And as before, this analysis is approximate. Generally, it overestimates the frequency because generally there's more capacitance in the circuit than we account for. So just keep that in mind. This is a way to get started, not the uh, final answer. So that concludes this lecture.